He's all right. Yeah, see, look, he did it. Oh, we're live. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. We're live. Yes. Welcome back to Photography Live and Uncut. Uh, my name is Paul Griffiths. You know that, but I'm delighted. Absolutely delighted. My guest tonight is Joel Chinchilla. Welcome to my show, Joel. Happy to be here, Paul. Thank you for that. Fantastic. Uh, I just going to say to the viewers before we've just chatted away and, he, and I said, right, I'm going to start the show. And Joel said, right, I'm going now, I'm walking away. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a very fair start, but there we go. We, I like I like a bit of joviality before the show starts. It's brilliant. Yeah. Joel, thank you so much because we've had a good conversation on um, on Messenger with Facebook as regards to uh, this show. And it's, it's great to get a sort of really good sort of background as regards to what we're going to talk about. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about your your beautiful landscape, um, city city work. But you, interestingly enough, you mentioned to me just before when you took up photography, your first main interest was landscape photography. Yeah. Um, how did how did uh, you get into initially with landscape photography? Well, actually, I started out with with seascape photography, but the, especially with long exposure uh, photography, because I, I saw the works from the, the likes of Michael Kenner and Michael Levin. Yeah. And I really found them interesting because of the surreal atmosphere that they created with the, uh, with the long exposure uh, techniques. So that's one of the reasons that I started out with uh, long exposure photography with landscape and seascape photography. And eventually that uh, panned out to uh, cityscapes and, uh, well, architectural photography. But that's, that's over the, the course of, let's say, five, six years. Exactly. And was, was there a specific moment that actually made you, dare I use the term, switch to taking cityscapes yeah that was a very specific moment yeah <laughs> because the thing is uh, if, if, if you for example if you look on the internet if you look on uh, facebook or Flickr or 500px then you will see a lot of those uh, seascape photographs you know the long especially long exposure minimalistic kind of seascape photographs and i thought well it, it is nice that i'm doing that but at some point, it, it kind of bored me you know it, it's mm. because you see that so much and i th thought you know uh, we're all emulating each other, you know, and, and that's something that that really uh, uh, wasn't in line with my more artistic and creative spirit. So I thought, yeah. you know what, I'm going to do something different, something that you didn't see a lot back then, and that was architectural photography because I already had an interest in, in architecture. I always wanted to be an architect, by the way, right. but, I, but I ended up as a criminal lawyer, so that's not a good thing, but anyway, <laughs> I'm a professional photographer right now, uh, but there was always this interest for architecture. Why? I don't know. It's, it's something that really, that really interests me. Architecture. I think, in actual fact, we touched on it just before. It's this, and I, I, I totally agree with what you were saying. When you get into these vibrant cities, London has now become a very vibrant city, as you mentioned. New yeah. York and the other cities that are around Europe, especially. And I think it, it's almost you're getting a buzz off of these. Uh, fantastic skylines that are being created now whether whether in actual fact you like modern architecture or or you are a traditionalist mm -hmm. sorry i was going to say whether you like modern architecture or whether you are a, tra a traditionalist and prefer the older style oh, I, I, I really do I really it really doesn't matter to me you know because i also like the, the more classical kind of architecture uh, like the for example if the, the architecture that you would see in cities like rome the pantheon the Colosseum. But I also have this uh, well, uh, this interest for for modern architecture. It's it's it, it really doesn't matter to me as, as long as it is uh, something that really speaks to me. And you also have to know, I'm most people call me an architectural photographer. But the thing is, I'm mostly a black and white photographer who tries to create fine art photographs with as object uh, architecture. It's just a, a random choice because it's uh, it's not really about the architecture. Of, of course, I'm using the the visual styling of the the, the architecture to to uh, well to, to to create something uh, and to evoke hopefully also some sort of an emotion with it uh, but actually the, the more sort of symbols you know to me yeah but there are symbols that really speak to me because it's a, i have this this uh, interest in in architecture that already had since i was a, was a was a kid and that and that, that always stuck with me and that's one of the reasons that I'm using architects because I like them from an aesthetic point of view, and also because they're the ideal symbols for 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 the uh, for the thing that I want to communicate with my photographs. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned as a kid you wanted to be an architect. Let's take you back to those those years. Very interestingly, uh, you you gave me some detail on on your earlier life. You had no recollection of a camera. Uh, 
to be honest with you, in your household at all? Uh, yeah, there were cameras, of course, but I don't even know what kind of cameras that were. I mean, they, uh, it, it was, the only thing that I still remember, it was a, a, an old Kodak camera. The, the, yes. The point of shoot uh, kind of thing with, with the, with the old fashioned flash on top of that, you know. The, I'm with you. Some, some like an flash. Instamatic basically by the sound of things, which was very popular in those days. Exactly. And uh, we also had that one. And yeah, I was already very interested in photography by then, uh, because I already wanted to buy myself a, uh, well, the, the more professional kind of uh, camera. But uh, my father and my mother were against it because they were too expensive back then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In actual fact, I've had a conversation similar. I, I, as a kid, I remember going into a camera shop and I think all the cameras, SLR cameras as they were, Practicas, Pentax, those two. I don't actually ever remember seeing a Canon or a Nikon, believe it or not. But they were all around about 350, 400 pounds. And obviously I couldn't afford that. Yeah, couldn't afford did. that in those days. So um, when, you, when you're at school, you... you you said earlier on just a while ago you wanted to be an architect yeah um but you became a criminal lawyer yeah. <laughs> it's, not hilarious, isn't it? it's not even that's not even close you know so it's not even close now can you, can you tell me how how this how this move came about <laughs> i don't even know <laughs> really no the thing is well my parents were very adamant that uh that I, I did something that that, that that was really valuable and that would uh, allow me to contribute to society. I mean, that that was something really very important. Uh, since I was, because the thing is in Holland, if you want to study architecture back then, then you had, you, you, you really need to have a very sound technical basis. You really have to be good at, at, at math, for example. I yeah. wasn't good at it at all. So, uh, well, and I still wanted to do an academic study, so I chose to do, uh, well, well, uh, criminal law. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So you studied criminal law. Where did you study that? Uh, in, uh, obviously, university. Where, where else was it? It was in the city of Tilburg in, in the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And what was that, a four- or five-year course? It is a four-year course. Yeah. Four-year course. Yeah. Out of, uh, out of university and straight into uh, a uh, practicing no, no, no. Um, then no. I went into the IT. <laughs> so I didn't do anything at all with, with uh, criminal law. Uh, so I went straight to the IT because it was around that time that there was this, this hype in, in the IT business, you know? Yeah. You could make a lot of money with that. And that was something that obviously interested me. So I thought, you know, sure. I'm going to do that. And so I've, I've been working in, in the IT business for almost 20 years. And well, and two years ago, I started well, uh, I quit my daytime job in the IT as a project manager and as a test manager as well. And I uh, became a full-time professional photographer. So that's what I am right now since uh, two years. Yeah. So uh, now I've known you a little bit longer than two years and I've seen your work coming up on it. There must have been a period of time where you obviously were doing both. Yeah. Uh, work in IT and, and setting up your workshops and stuff like that. Yeah. Let's talk about the setting up of the workshops and how that came about. Well, the first workshop that I did was actually, I, I was a guest uh, for a Mark Google workshop uh, that was here in, I think it was in Amsterdam. So it was the very first time that I, that I did a workshop, but I already had plans to do some workshops. And that was with one of the initial founders of the Vision Explorers, that was Daniel Portal, because he was already doing some uh, and organizing some workshops in, the, in, in, Ar in Argentina together with uh, some other famous photographer and, and so one day he asked me to do uh, a workshop together with him and well actually he wanted to do a workshop with, uh, with him uh, in Argentina but we changed plans and at, at some point we ended up in New York City doing a, a, an architecture workshop so that's how it all came about and um, but what do, do you want to know, Paul? Do you want to know how I set up that kind of workshop? What, what well, I, yeah, it's interesting because you, there you are. You've been invited as a guest along to help out with the workshop. You've obviously yep. at that stage, you've thought, wow, I enjoy doing this. So then the next stage obviously was for you to set up your, your own workshop series, I assume. Yeah, the, the, the nice thing about doing workshops, besides uh, the, the teaching, of course, is that yeah. you also get to travel a lot. And, and yeah. I really like that, you know, because now I, I got to travel to cities like New York City, Chicago, or, or even to, to Australia, and at the same time making money with that. So what's more beautiful than making money doing something that you love and at the same time 
travel around the world. So I thought, you know what, that, this is something that I really want to do full time. So that's what, yeah, what I've been exactly. doing ever it's, since. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, then, of course, we're, we're going to uh, shortly, we're going to have a look at your work and you're just going to talk us through. There's new projects coming on board now, which is is nice to see from a photographer that is prepared to sort of, yeah, I've, I've done that work. I want to now move into another area. I want to try and push the boundaries a little bit more, which is which is really great. But uh, let's just come back to the workshops in terms of uh, of what you're looking to achieve for the individual that comes to to an event like that? Well, it depends on the individual, of course, but most of the times if uh, people come to my workshop, they are always interested in, in two two things. It's either uh, long exposure photography, yeah, something that I'm uh, known for, I think, and also yeah. for my black and white post-processing method. Always those two things. So th that's all. That's, those are also the things that people are always uh, ask me a lot about. And, and they want to want me to do some some extensive demonstrations uh, so that that's that's interesting on the basis then you obviously your workshops are out in the field taking the photograph but then of course because you have this additional interest from the uh, i'm going to use the word student but uh, that attends your workshops they want to know how you actually develop that image so you're actually yeah. they're doing quite a lot of work in the studio so to speak with with them yeah yeah, absolutely. So what, what we do during uh, a workshop like that, for example, in New York City, is to spend a few days out in the field. Well, actually half a day, because we start the, the day with, with, with some sessions in the classroom, for, for example. And then we talk about uh, the fine art photography. We also talk about uh, uh, my black and white post-processing post method, of course. And then we go out shooting. So that's basically how a day looks like uh, during a workshop. Okay, uh, can I just touch on the post processing uh, processing uh, style that you've created? Because after that, we'll, uh, th uh, that comment, we'll go to your screen share and have a look at your work. I'm assuming uh, I've seen some of the uh, 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 hangouts that you've done before and some videos. A lot of all your processing is done using Photoshop. Yeah. Um, but the main thing which I found amazing today, literally today, I read it's all self taught. It's uh, self-taught, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And because, it, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Because the thing is, uh, back in, I think it was in 2010, I was, back then, I was still the ambassador of Nick's software. I've also done a, f a promotional video with them in San Diego, promoting mm -hmm. the whole SilverFX 2, uh, well, software plugin. But uh, at the same time, I was already moving towards a different direction because I thought, you know, all those plugins and also Photoshop and, and other plugins like uh, uh, Topaz, for example, they were always yeah. based on the original color information in, in a photograph. And I just wanted to leave that whole thing behind me because I thought, you know, if I really want to express myself, if I really want to come up with something that's really me and that's that really gives an indication of who I am, I needed to come up with something so I shouldn't be limited to the original color information in the photograph. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to develop uh, something that's uh, uh, a, a new method of black and white post processing that, that's independent of the original color information because that's re was really important to me. So I came up with this, uh, what, what I call now ISGM workflow. So basically okay. that's the, the, the whole story in, in, in a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell, yeah, exactly. I think that's a very good time for us to go and have a look at what can only be described as superb work um and uh, i was interested you made a, a comment there with regards to photographers that you had followed uh earlier uh, michael kenner michael levin uh the two guys that you mentioned two photographers which i'm i know uh, well i know michael kenner reasonably well i, I know of michael levin i've got his book zebra mm -hmm. um oh, it's not called zebra is it it's called uh Sobrato. Zebrato, sorry, I was close. Zebrato, um, but the same thing. Zebra and Zebrato, almost. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Exactly, it is the same thing, isn't it? Um, so what I want to do, I want to come to your. This is the for those that are watching the uh, the show. At the top here, we have the new project uh, yeah. by uh, Agile, which is called Sub Subjectivism, and uh, we'll come to that later yeah. because it's just one particular one particular portfolio I want to show first, which is nothing to do with architecture at all but i do you know these have just blown me away mm, thank you blown me away yeah. uh still life photography yeah. something that you you don't do that often joel or is it is it, it you do it, that in your pastime so to speak 
Uh, yes, exactly. The thing is, I, I still love uh, still life photography because I was also inspired by the likes of, for, for example, Robert Mapplethorpe, you know, and and mm -hmm. Imogen Cunningham, so the the great still life photographers. And there's something about it. I don't know what exactly, but uh, they really interest me. And um, I haven't done them a lot. Uh, I've, I've done them more in the past, as you can see on, on my website. And these days, I only occasionally shoot a still life photograph, but uh, it's still something that really. Um, interest me quite a lot quite a lot yeah. can i just ask as i'm just going through because I, I want to get onto the architecture work because that, that effectively is what you're known for this particular uh, these images we're looking at could you tell us as regards to what your basic setup is for the image uh, i use uh, an off-camera flash for that one uh, i don't know anymore how many uh, studio lights are you uh, i've used for that i think there were two lights um that's all I can remember because it was so long ago. <laughs> it's already said. Oh, okay. This shot, but and that's what the same. I, I always use uh, off-camera flash for the for, for all those still life photographs that you see there. Yeah, beautiful yeah. tones and beautiful texture that you've been able to create. Obviously, by positioning the flash yeah. in the right position and getting the uh, the exposure right. This uh, lovely yeah. work. And mostly inspired by by Robert Mapplethorpe, as you can see. Yeah. Because of the, the let's say the more erotic element in, the, in some of those photographs and as you know uh, robert mapplethorpe had always had this uh, erotic motive in, in, in his still life photographs and you can also see that with my some of my canna lily photographs of course yeah not, not with this one this, this is more uh, an exercise in visual style and in, in black and white post processing but yeah. i'm going to do more of those uh, still life photographs in the, in the near future as well because they, they also fit into my new project you know of uh, subjectivism yeah let's uh just skip that one let's go to the the images which are are synonymous with joel chinchilla yeah these uh, are the look up at the sky kind of uh, look at this look up at the sky get the buildings at different angles i always yeah. remember one photograph that i presented in a competition once and i i just taken a, a photograph of a hotel and i just tip the tip the camera sort of like as the, i think they like to call it the dutch angle and the, the, the Dutch and angle, what, what the is that? Angle. It's like the, the like the hotel was at forty five degrees, so to speak. Okay. And uh, and uh, the the judge said, I don't like buildings that are not upright. So okay. that was the end of that one. But this is this is where you uh, uh, the work which you're synonymous with this looking up, getting the uh, they're yeah. obviously using the ND uh, stopper and the. Yeah. the long exposure of the skies by the way I, I, i'm not using the big stopper of course because that's uh, fr from from lee of course i'm using yeah. the format high tech filters <laughs> with my name oh, okay <laughs> so we have so, to make yes. this correction okay <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, my apologies yes the name on the product my apologies so uh that's uh so the, the, these are my uh, older architecture work by the way so yeah they were all shot with the, with the camera pointed to the sky so that's a different kind of look and feel than if you look uh and if you would compare that with my more recent kind of uh, architecture photographs which are more straightforward the, yeah. the, the landscape seascape like uh, approach of uh, architecture but th these were more about about lines and about curves and about uh, well, you can see that in this photograph, for example, with, with, with the staircase that you see here. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's, it's more, uh, it's more sort of a, a play with, with, with the geometrical lines and shapes and stuff like that. Yeah. It's it's not the kind of architectural photography that I that I'm still doing these days because now I'm I'm more interested in the let's say the, the more straightforward approach with using the tilt shift lens. Yeah. And it uh, it, it it's it's more. It's technically more complicated, I think, and it's also more challenging to me. So that's a nice little segue, actually, there to talk about the type of gear that you're using. Um, this is one of my uh, favorites that I've seen here. This, this uh, was shot in Berlin together with the the first ever Euro Photo Walk, uh, organized by. Uh, oh, okay. And go and well together with some other Google Plus. Uh, friends and contacts yeah and that's taken uh, uh this was a shot taken in rotterdam that's the in rotterdam sorry yeah okay Zetkin building yeah i was thinking of uh, the famous one on the uh, riverside in london which everyone takes oh uh, yeah the very sharp angled building this one is in new york city that's uh, the state, the yeah. state yeah 
I thought that this is a nice uh, angle to take uh, the building. So yeah, um, just just take this image as an example um, with your Photoshop process of working through. Was this done Photoshop or was this using uh, Nick Silver Effects? Uh, this, this was done uh, using my own method and with right, Photoshop. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and effectively the way you work is is layers upon layers and it's and a masking layers. and that sort of thing. Exactly, it's all about layers, layers, layers. A, a lot about uh, mask as well. But I think, let's say, uh, if you if you would compare my uh, method of black and white post processing to, uh, and you would uh, compare it with, with other methods of black and white post processing, it, then it's all about controlling shapes and light in my uh, in my approach. So yeah, that's why I developed this this specific method because the thing is, I'm always working with uh, with with hard selections. Uh, and also with soft selection. Well, the hard selections are the normal, regular selection that you can create in Photoshop with using the the marquee tool, for example. Or, or uh, but, uh, and the soft selections are the luminosity mass selections. So, and the thing is, with with the hard selection, I can with the hard selection I can control uh, shapes, and with the soft selections or the luminosity mass selection I can control light. So, and yeah. basically, shapes and light are the two only. Uh, objects that you the two only elements that you always see in any kind of photograph so shapes and light so i've developed this method of uh well that i call isgr to control on one hand uh, all the shapes with the hard selection and on the other hand to control light with the luminosity mass selection and then i come uh I, then i try to integrate those two uh, selections in, in in my workflow and then by the use of gradients i try to blend them together and yeah. I'm deliberately using the gradient tool because that's the, 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 the most subtle way that you can blend these images together or tonalities together, for example. Yeah. So that's uh, basically in a nutshell my... That's basically in a nutshell how you do this work. Yeah, my workflow. <clears throat> Your workflow there. Let's uh, come up a little bit more to uh, a little bit more. Am I coming more up to date now with this type of work? This, this is more up to date. Yeah, this is shot in 2014, and obviously New York City. It, it yeah. is London. It doesn't look like London at all. But, no, but, it doesn't. No. <laughs> but uh, well, the, this is more the, the straightforward approach, as you can see. Yes, say. it's more the approach that you would also use when you are shooting landscapes or seascapes. So with your camera pointing straight forward instead of straight up to the sky. Yeah, but, exactly. But that, uh, that requires a specific kind of technique because you, the thing is if you uh, approach architecture like that then you need to have the straight lines of course because the yes. thing is you always have this orientation point in the form of a horizon and you don't want things to look off you know because they have to be straight and so uh, it's it's a more te uh, technical side of architecture photography for which you, well ideally you would uh, use a, a tilt shift lens that you something like yeah. this for example so what I use all the time is a 24 millimeter tilt shift lens, and basically this this lens almost glued onto my camera, you know, and uh, and, uh, and I very rarely use another kind of lens, but this this is my uh, my standard lens, and basically I can do anything with that lens. <clears throat> yeah. that, that's also an except. Well, this this is just a handheld shot that I took from off, uh, from the top of the rock in, in New York City. And uh, it's it's just, it's a it's a little bit different than the rest of my architecture photographs because yeah. this is not a long exposure photograph. No, but I really like the cinematic mood look at. Yes, I was going to. I was trying to think of the word, and you've hit it on nail on the head there. Uh, cinematic type view of this. Yeah. It's like something that you would probably see. I know there's a couple of modern buildings in the background there, but you could almost uh, escape yourself and think this was taken around about the 60s and the 70s. That's also what I want intended to do. Yeah. yeah. This was shot in Chicago. That is uh, the, the Trump Tower in the background, and yep. the, the Wrigley Building in front of that. And uh, so, th the basically conflicting types of architecture. You know, the, the yes. old versus the, the the new. Trump versus uh, uh, Wrigley. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Trump versus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Imagine, imagine that for a presidential race. <laughs> yeah. we'll, leave we'll leave the politics. We'll leave the politics. Yeah. But uh, yes, I can see uh, the the development here of. Uh, and this is shot in Paris, in, in the yeah, in Paris, yeah. La this is, uh, in La Défense area, yeah, which is quite an amazing place to visit uh, and see these buildings. Yes, uh, I recognise this. Yeah. Um, this is just over the road for me from the CNET building where I do quite a bit of work uh, okay. with the exhibitions. So yeah, 
uh, and of course the fifth the arch yeah the grand arch so, yeah. the and this grand one is this one is shot in, in, in oh you already go back, i'll go back oh. sorry yes i dumped sorry this is the Calatrava bridge uh, close to Amsterdam. Uh, this is okay. The, so the, this, with, with, with this photograph, I started this whole visual acoustic series that I, that you that you're looking at right now. So this was the yeah. first one from that series. It looks like a shark's fin coming coming at you. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's I, I like the I like the way when you're taking photographs here. You, you're almost you're looking at the image and then you start thinking of what else it reminds you of. By the way, uh, did, so, that that uh, Calatrava Bridge photograph. Uh, it's it's now hanging in in a gallery in New York City at the Rotella Gallery in New York City. By the way, well uh, for for that first that is hanging in the gallery in New York City, I've been working in total something like one hundred one hundred and forty hours, because I've been wow. watching and burning all those separate cables, uh, well, uh, yeah, se separate from each other. So I had to do that to, to retain all the details, especially when you're trying to print it very large and to, yeah. Um, uh, because that one is, I think, something like uh, almost six foot. Wow, that must be pretty awesome to see. And this was one of the first photographs uh, uh, in which I started using my, my my method of black and white post processing. It's called it, this is at the, uh, at the Salk Institute in San Diego. So this is where it all started for me with the with my uh, self developed method of black and white post processing. Yeah, I see. Rotterdam is that this Rotterdam? Yeah, it's not a very uh, exciting picture, but uh, I recognize this place. Now, where's that? It, I think that's New York. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the, this is a, okay. I also like to double around a little bit with with color, as you can see. But yeah, I've, I've been trying to do that in a very specific uh, sort of fine art uh, way, mm -hmm. and I've been inspired to to do that in, in this specific way. Uh, while uh, while looking at the, at the old master paints, like for example Rembrandt, mm -hmm. uh, always use a very uh, limited color palette, you know. And yes. that's also what I've been trying to do. And the thing is, if you if you're uh, if you're trying to use color, that uh, most people tend to forget it. If you use very vibrant, very saturated colors, and it will it uh, it, it it will let's say uh, distract from the from, from the main object exactly. if, you don't, if you don't use it in in, in, in the right way. So it's almost to, it almost overpowers the image, doesn't it, with the, with with the color? Exactly. So, but yeah. that's that's just my philosophy, and that's my approach. I to think it. it's a very good point because a lot of people, as I mentioned a couple of days ago, with some guys I was doing a workshop with, where the, we were talking about HDR photography, and of course, when HDR first came out, everyone went to what I would term the nth degree, just went so grunge on everything, and yeah. oversaturated, and over sharpened, and and you got these what appeared to be at the time obviously everyone thought wow but uh, they over time they people started to think well it's uh it's yeah. pretty uh pretty overdone and if you bring back the subtlety into an image like in this particular one which i think yeah. is a classic example it, it just lends itself so well to the image uh and and uh it creates a, a piece of beauty it's almost a monochromatic use of colors you know which exactly is, right they're, yeah. they're just a few colors like uh, the blue and the, and the turquoise and yeah, the turquoise uh, but, yeah but they're really close together you know so yeah and that's I've, I've done it very deliberately because i just wanted to uh i wanted the viewer to focus on the the, the main object in my image and that's of course the, the sharp with the skyline yeah there. and if i would use all sorts of uh, more vibrating saturated colors then it would take away from that specific uh, uh, yeah. we are for the specific focus on that all these style. images we're looking at here uh, uh joel you're using the uh, 24 mil uh, tilt shift lens yeah yeah this is also 24 yeah okay and uh tower bridge tower bridge yeah and uh brooklyn bridge yeah so brooklyn yes it is brooklyn yeah this is brooklyn bridge yeah yeah, yeah. And this the is uh, one of my favorite photographs. That's uh, the Pantheon in Rome. Love, love the base of the image with the moving people. Yeah. Very uh, Titarenko type work. Yeah. If if you would uh, if you would zoom in into this photograph, if you could do that, but you cannot zoom in, of course. But then you would see all the the the, the, the handbags that still standing on the ground over yeah. there. Because I, I didn't clone out anything because that's also no, uh, no. let's say a character, characteristic aspect of my. Uh, approach to towards photography that I always try to avoid cloning out elements out of my photographs. I prefer to 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 tone them down. Uh, 
instead to, to darken them, for example. So I can almost conceal them in, in my photographs. So yeah. if, if you would look at the, at, at the right corner of the, sorry, the left corner on my image, the lower left corner, you, would, you could see a car over there. Right, okay. Just barely see it. You, you cannot see it, so I didn't remove the car. Of no, I, I just made it darker, so it, yeah. it, it wouldn't stand out in in, in the picture. <clears throat> but this is one of my favorite uh, photographs. That is a shot that I've uh, done for for Format High Tech because this this was a shot that they needed for the new Firecrest uh, sixty stops filters. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So that's that's not really. <clears throat> that's not really one of my favorite photographs, but I thought it uh, it looked nice with all the uh, curved lines that you see there, and and the use of the of the well my, my black and white post processing uh, method, of course. Is that the is that the building designed by the uh, uh, the lady uh, architect who's recently died? Oh no, Zaha so did no 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 it's not not okay. No. I'm getting confused with another one, but she did. And then you got the uh, Colosseum here, yeah, which again you're bringing in color there in a very subtle. Yeah. Time away. Yeah. It's a little bit more saturated than the than the, let's say yeah. more recent color work, but still I think it's uh, uh, it, it's still okay. I think. Yeah. I think it lends itself to the actual fact what the Colosseum is all about. You know, a dark, gloomy place back in the day, and uh, I think the what you've created there sort of lends itself to what the what the actual stadium was all about. Yeah, and I also like the inclusion of all the people that you see there. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say that the inclusion of the people in actual fact adds to it. Um, uh, it could be mistaken for uh, um, a, a sort of like a almost a street ph photograph, but it's sort of yeah. a mix of a street photograph yeah, and yeah. an architecture photograph. It's not yeah. something that I uh, that I used to do a lot, by the way. Yeah. So I always try to avoid the inclusion of of, of people in my photographs. But yeah, <clears throat> okay. Let's uh, let's go up to the the final uh, sub uh, subjectivism. Yeah, uh, which is your new work, and uh, you you wanted to uh, to tell us about this new project of yours. So uh, here's the time to to go ahead with it, Joe. Well, the the thing is, it's uh, I've been doing a lot of architectural work in the past, of course, and uh, hopefully at some point you could also see it in the development of my architectural work that it's not so much more about the uh, the architectural object itself, but more uh, about the symbolic use of architecture in my photographs. So uh, lately, I've been uh, working on this uh, theory. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm writing down my theory in in well, it's already something like twenty pages long, and it's it's a sort of a, a f a philosophical foundation to justify the work that I'm doing right now. It's at first it is meant for myself as a sort of artistic justification, but the thing about and it, uh, about subjectivism, as I call it, is that uh, you have to know. Two things, uh, Paul. Because <clears throat> if you if you if, it, if we talk about art in general, if we talk about, for example, painting, if you look at a painting, then uh, and if you look, for example, at the abstract expressionist painters like, for example, Mark Rothko or Barnett Newman or Jackson Pollock, what you don't see in in, in those paintings is that that there is no real uh, object in it. Okay, I'm calling that the thing that you that you capture in your frame. I'm calling that the object matter instead of subject matter that we uh, that that we uh, usually uh, 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 refer to. If, if we talk about the let's say the, the thing that you are capturing in your frame, right? They always mm -hmm. refer to it as subject matter. But the thing is, and I, and I got this from the American abstract expressionist painter Barnett Newman. He said, "Okay, my paintings are very abstract." It, because it doesn't have anything concrete in, in, in its frame, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have a subject matter. So what, what, what he said is, okay, I don't have anything. I don't have a real object matter in my in my painting in my frame, but there is a subject matter, and the subject matter is is his uh, his intention, the emotion that he wanted to communicate with the viewer. That is the real subject matter, and so mm -hmm. the object matter is the thing that you that you capture in your frame. So if if you, if you extrapolate that to uh, phot photography, for example, if you look at my photographs, then what I'm using here is a specific kind of object matter. So I'm not calling it subject matter because subject matter is my intention. It's the thing that I want to communicate with the viewer. So this is my object matter. It's 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 architecture, but it's just a symbolic use of of of, of this object matter. That's that's uh, that's uh, in this case 
coincidentally, architecture. Yeah. So my subject matter is something different. And my, uh, my subject matter in this case is that I wanted to communicate some kind of emotion. Well, it, if you look at the, the, the title Maelstrom, it should already give you a hint of what that kind of emotion is. So I'm not going to tell you about the emotion that I wanted to evoke with this photograph. I'm not also not going to tell you how to look at this photograph because that's something that I shouldn't be doing as, uh, as someone who pretends to be an, an artist, okay? I'm just giving you a hint for that. But just know this, subjectivism is all about uh, the difference between subjectivism, uh, sorry, sub uh, subject matter and object matter. Object matter is a thing in your frame, while the subject matter is the thing that you try to communicate with the viewer. Mm -hmm. So the whole new series is all about uh, this difference and also about the, the the need to communicate emotions with your view because for me real art is all about communicating emotions not so much yeah. about communicating intellectual statements because i'm not interested in that i'm more interested in, in using art as a, a way to communicate emotions so th th that is what subjectivism is all about and in this case i've been using a, an architectural object for my uh to convey my subject matter, to convey my emotion, but it could well as well be uh, a still life work, for example. Yeah. So my newer work is not so much more about architecture; it's more about subjectivism. It's more about subject uh, subjectivity. It's, it's also a, a, a response to the uh, to the new objectivity from the the, the famous German school uh, for, uh, of which. Uh, Andreas Gursky, the famous photographer, is a, uh, protagonist, uh, one of the protagonists. You know, you know Andreas Gursky, Paul? The, the I don't know. No, it's, it's a new name for me. He sold his Rhine II photograph for something like four or five million dollars, something like that. It's one of the most wow. expensive photographs ever. So that's Andreas Gursky, and he's one of the protagonists of the new objectivity movement that's, that originated from, from uh, uh, the Düsseldorf School of Art, I think, in, in Germany. But okay. Uh, objectivity was all about, uh, uh, well, capturing objects in a very neutral and objective way, without any emotion at all. So it's 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 almost a sort of a documentary style of photography, but without the the, the storytelling. It's it's just a very neutral and a very objective approach, and I really didn't like that because I thought, you know, if I'm going to 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 uh, well say uh, express myself through uh, in a very neutral, objective way then it doesn't say anything about myself, you know, because for me, art is all about uh, subjectivity. It's all about uh, the artist itself, about expressing emotions. And you don't have that with, uh, with, with, uh, with a very objective approach towards art <clears throat> and towards your, your object matter. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. I, I really didn't like it. So that's why I also developed this own theory on subject, uh, sub subjectivism. Uh, and basically, the way you've uh, developed these particular these images, uh, the process is it, you're still using your uh, your your usual method of uh, of creating the image. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Still using that, that, my, so my that general. part. That part hasn't changed. It it uh, is just the uh, um, the the viewing of of the image and the creation of the image. There's only three in this series at the moment uh, that yeah. you've uh, posted it's, up. It's, it's a new it's, project. It's, it's still in progress. I'm still working on the let's say the the philosophical foundation of of it. So the yeah. the, the philosophical justification of my creative uh, expression. Uh, so it's 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 still a work in progress. And actually, this this one of the uh, St Paul's Cathedral doesn't really yeah. belong there. But this one, it's called number one. Because I, I really wanted to avoid uh, giving too many clues as to what I'm referring to in, from an emotional point of view. So, yeah. I, so I only named the photograph one. Uh, the the other one, by the way, that's the yeah. Sorry, number one, yeah. So now the number three is number one. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. I was looking at the number of the image on the thing. Yeah, that the, one there. Number three is number one. Yeah, this is called yes, number one. You, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I also wanted to uh, communicate a specific kind of emotion with that. I'm not going to tell you what, because I leave that up to the viewer. And hopefully yeah, exactly. some of the, of, the, of the viewers who will, who will look at this photograph will also acknowledge that and recognize some, some of the, those emotions, because that's, that's what uh, art is to me, you know? communicate emotions yeah uh and dare i ask is there a book to follow on the, on this particular project uh, uh well no I'm, I'm still working on my sort of a thesis <laughs> right okay <laughs> and perhaps i'm going to publish it uh, anytime soon but that, i don't know when yet for, for now it's just a, a, a thesis that's only meant for, for myself 
I think yeah. for some for some of my students as well, because I also do some online mentorships, and then I, uh, I, t I discuss uh, with my students all those kind of uh, aspects that are related to fine art photography, and one of them is uh, subjectivism. That's uh, an interesting project, which uh, uh, I can see a book. I can see a book coming, because talking of books, uh, the book that you uh, collaborated with uh, Juliana uh, yeah. about the. Uh, about the architectural type style that both of you uh, yeah. uh, work with um, that uh, which I have got on the iPad um, uh, uh, to my great disappointment I thought it was going to be a printed version uh, of the book but uh, it was too much money to produce I understand we still intend to uh, publish a printed version of the book but uh, but like you already mentioned it's uh, it's it's quite complicated to yeah. to publish a real hard copy book because it uh, well first of all it it, it 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 costs a lot of money to make it uh, well the thing is uh, you need to have enough buyers to make it profitable for yourself you know exactly yeah and if you don't have that and uh, then it, the book is going to be quite expensive and we don't want that either but no. I, I, th I still think in this f uh, format as a as an ebook it's still a, a a valuable book i guess i mean yes yeah uh, I've been writing this book together with uh, with, with Juliana Gospodaru, uh, who was actually the initiator of this this book, by the way. So I have to, yeah. to, to mention that. Yeah, that's right. I remember her saying uh, saying in the show that she she got this idea, and because we were talking about inspirations, which we're going to come to later on, and of course her inspiration was your good self, and yeah. she said that the, the great help that you put into the book when you started to collaborate with it. So yeah, you're right. So uh, she was the instigator of the book. I, I was just her humble assistant. Yeah, yes. <laughs> in quite a uh, a major way, the way Juliana was describing it too, and and she's been quite uh, quite busy recently. I've noticed uh, with her workshops going around the world, which is great to see. Absolutely yeah. great to see. And as as previously we mentioned uh, in uh, when I interviewed her, she was a and is an architect, which is interesting. You wanted to be one, she was one, but had to move out of it because of the uh, recession which had hit Greece at the time. It's strange, it's isn't it? This it is very, very strange and a coincidence. But a love of photography comes through. Yeah. Let's briefly talk about gear. Um, we know the lens, which your preference of lens, a twenty-four mil tilt shift. What's yeah. what's the what's the body that you're using? At this point uh, in time, I'm using the uh, five DSR. This so that's the fifty megapixel camera. Yep. Uh, well, th that's, uh, that's that's it in a nutshell. That's that's that a nutshell. Yeah, what can I say about this this camera? I mean, fifty I think, megapixels. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm. I'm uh, well, I deliberately deliberately went for this fifty megapixel camera because I wanted. I needed to have a lot of uh, pixels because I'm always trying to print my work quite large as, as yes. large prints. So I needed something that uh, had enough uh, pixels, and and the Canon was one of them. So I. I've been using this camera since uh, uh, three, four months, and before that, I used the Canon 5D Mark III. Okay, it's but, interesting you mentioned that one because I was very fortunate to talk to. I don't know if you know the photographer, English photographer based in Japan, Martin Bailey. I've and, heard of him. Uh, yes, <clears throat> you have heard of him, um, and he was using the 5D Mark III. Yeah. Um, I think in what uh, you moved on to another Canon model, uh, and then this one came to uh, came to market, and he was in the shop and. He went in there, and at the time we were talking on the uh, uh, on Google Plus with regards to he was considering the possibility of switching to a mirrorless camera, yeah. which I believe was the thing of Sony at the time. Yeah. He went into the shop, he picked that camera up, went outside, took a photograph, and he was astounded because, in actual fact, I, th I forget which lens he had on it. Maybe it was a seventy-two ten, something of that nature. He didn't actually he couldn't actually work out where the photograph, where the the, the image had been taken because they had zoomed in so close on the image with such fine detail, he realized that the actual fact he'd focused on a billboard about 250 yards away. And he said he couldn't believe the quality. And at that point, just went back in, bought one, came back in the next day, sold it, did a trade in with the others, and now he's got two and he uses those for his uh, his nature and his wildlife photography. Did, did he buy the, the Sony or the Canon? No, he bought the Canon. The Canon, oh, the the Canon. Canon you have there, yeah. Yeah, bought the Canon. Yeah, now he moved away from the idea because basically I can understand people that have that have got equipment, <clears throat> they're embedded into a system mm -hmm. to move literally one whole from one system to another does involve a, a significant amount of money, yeah. uh, especially when we're talking about quality top level lenses like the twenty four tilt shift. I 
I don't expect any stretch that that's any cheap lens. So to move in from that, and I don't think there is a tilt shift lens available for any mirrorless camera system at the moment, unless you want to use an adapter. Exactly, you have to use an adapter. Uh, I'm not so much into the, the, the world of mirrorless cameras. Uh, 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 and the reason that I didn't go to Sony, for example, to, to, to a mirrorless camera is basically because of all the lenses that I already had and all the other accessories that I already had for, for this camera. So yeah. I thought it, it wasn't uh, worth my uh, money and, and effort to, to to switch completely over to the to another camera and beside that and i mean i, I know how the, the canon performs i don't know how the the, the sony performs so yeah so, and it, it, this is a very good point you make here let's just just uh, talking about gear for a second because i think this is when when a lot of people are out there trying to to think and to work out which camera to buy i don't think they actually take into consideration what they're going to use the camera for I think they 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 look at that looks a nice camera that looks that'll look good um uh, so and so uses that camera that's great but they don't actually turn and say well what am i going to shoot am i going to shoot sports photography in which case you don't want to buy a mirrorless am i going to shoot uh, shoot landscapes or am i going to be looking to do tilt shift type work and with the, with those decisions made then you go in and make a decision on the camera that you can afford to buy and the best one is to buy the one that you can afford Pay the most for yeah. exactly right exactly right I, I would like to have a phase one camera but actually it's a little bit out of my out of my range you know <laughs> yeah exactly i saw today the the latest hasselblad being advertised for something like seventeen thousand nine hundred pounds on a trade-in so i'd hate to think what the real price is it's probably around about 40 odd k it's ridiculous it's it's, it's really ridiculous yeah it is, it's it a lot a lot of money for that sort of thing and uh uh well, and I, I, I can still I can still shoot great photographs with this uh, reasonably yep. priced camera, you know. It's, uh, but of course, uh, having great gear is also very important for for you for your morale, you know. I mean, it's always nice to work with some with some great looking and a tactile camera that's basically you hit the nail on the head that you know how how it works, you're comfortable with the way it works, and you can go to any particular part of the menu that you that you want to with your eyes shut for argument's sake you know exactly where it is exactly yeah that, that's, that's really so important, important to me it's so important so important um thank you so much for the comments on your work there uh, joel because i think when people look at your work they immediately think yes long exposure i don't think they really uh understand how much hard work goes into actually creating the image and, and what in actual fact you've done to develop that and furthering on with regards to consistently looking to to develop on from a skill uh starting off with mono now bringing in some subtle tones of color and then of course the the latest new project so thank you so much for uh, talking that through because uh, for those that have are watching the show now and they're watching in the future it's going to be invaluable to them if they're interested in uh, taking up this uh, this type of work i would like to just touch on one thing uh, uh it is a t style now of photography which has become very, very popular. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of people out there doing it. Uh, Tuan and Guyon, I think you know Tuan, uh, mm -hmm. and we know uh, Juliana. We've spoken about and Irene Kuhn as well, yeah. photographers. But there, you know, it is it something which you think sometimes I've got to move on to something totally different, or are you happy just to stay with what you're doing now? That's one of the reasons that I've started this new project called Subjectivism because it's uh, uh, it's independent of the object matter. So I, c I yeah. could I can do that with, uh, with with architecture objects, still my favorite type of object. But I can also do that with with still life uh, photographs, for example, still life subject objects. Yeah. So basically, that's uh, that's something that uh, that so, uh, I've been moving away from that just a little bit. But yes. Still, um, uh, there's still a lot of architecture in my work. Another thing that I'm re still really interested in is doing uh, portraiture. Uh, that's that's one of my first loves, uh, portrait uh, photo photography. So that's something that I'm hopefully going to pick up anytime soon in the future. But I've been saying that for that, the last five, six years. So <laughs> <laughs> it's always it's always good to have a plan in the background just in case things do go where. But there's obviously still a demand for your uh, your uh, long exposure architectural work for for your workshops. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I'm yeah. I'm going to have a, a workshop in Vienna on August. Uh, what was it? Says 26, 27, 28. In Vienna, so it's uh, going to be a black and white long exposure workshop in the beautiful city of Vienna. We're also going to shoot a Saha Hadid building from the outside and from the inside. So that's uh, going to be quite special. 
Yes. So we have, uh, we have a permit to shoot the, the building from the inside. She was something really special, Zaha, um, with uh, with a, uh, her architecture work. A, a truly amazing architect, and uh, unfortunately, I don't know, she was made a dame in this country, but I don't think she really did get the uh, the just desserts of a, a full full ac ac acclaim around the world. It, 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 she's one of the most inspiring architects. Well, unfortunately, she already died, of course, but yes. she was one of the most inspiring architects of the last decades, I think. Okay. Yes, I agree but, with you. But the thing is, if you look at architecture photographers, the, the, the strange thing is that, the, 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 for me at least, the two top photographers in architecture are are also women. You know, if you look at Juliana Cospitaru, yeah. Also look at Irene Kong. I mean those are two women yes but they really had a shoulders above the rest for, in my view in terms of architecture photography and the one thing uh, talking about uh, those two in particular uh, let's just talk about Irene Kun for a moment the one thing I like about Irene Kun's work basically started off as an artist as you know and then developed into photography being told by uh, by her um, a gallery why don't you photograph rather than paint these these buildings she's now moving uh, away from architecture she's done the subject matter on trees recently i noticed one of her pieces of work absolutely stunning beautiful work yeah i've, I've seen it too i, I really like yeah. her work yeah yeah she's beautiful work and uh juliana continues to uh go with the uh the architectural line for the for the moment uh, but uh again such a busy lady with all her workshops sure. um we come to the time of the show where a lot of my guests don't really like to answer the question. I think sometimes it's because they don't want to be associated with that photographer. They don't want to think that they've they've copied that style. But uh, you very kindly sent me through uh, two particular photographers, obviously that uh, of of uh, are your favourites. Who would be your favourite photographer, Joel? Well, if if you look at the let's say at the the, the, the people that uh, inspired me to, to come up to, well to do photography and then I have to look at let's say the deal the master photographers like uh, Richard Avedon or yeah. cars and uh, Irving Penn but if, if you look at uh, today's photography then I think there are two people standing out from from the rest of the crowd so the, let's say the upcoming uh, artists of the future yes well, one of them is uh, of course uh, Juliana Gasparro because she's one of the best architecture photographers that I know of. And the other one is uh, an Indonesian photographer and his, his name is Henki Kunchuro. So Henke. those, Henki Kunchuro, yeah. I think yes, those yeah, two yeah. are, uh, well, are, are at the vanguard of today's black and white fine art photography. I couldn't agree more with you. I've been very fortunate to have both of them on my show. Henki uh, just produced uh, some images of uh, some uh, underwater uh, photography of uh, of um, I forgot what you call it now, sort of crustacean type things and jellyfish and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Truly amazing work. But then looking at all of his other other work as well, Juliana. Well, again, we mentioned about her before, and again, I was very fortunate to talk to her on a previous show about her career and how she developed through. And and, and yes, they are definitely out of today's modern top slot. But you mentioned two photographers there, Irving Penn and Richard Avedon. Yeah. When you actual fact go back and look at those guys' work, you know, it's it's where, and you're quite right, is where the inspiration comes from for the modern day photographer to to look at this work. I don't think any photographer can ignore the uh, the, the the greats from, from the past. Uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson we talked about earlier on. Yeah. You've got to look at this type of work to yeah. associate yourself with photography and to appreciate their skill and, and what uh, what can be achieved. Absolutely, you have to look at the, the history of photography. You have to look at all the master, old master photographers. But yeah. more importantly, I think, and this is where real progress comes from, is to also look at the history of painting and to look at the old master painters. Because the thing yes. is, if you look at photography as a discipline, it, it, it's all it's only there for the, for the last 150 years, you know. That's right. And, yeah, and it evolved to something called fine art photography with with, with, with Alfred Stieglitz. Well, almost a century ago, so yeah. it's just a, just a relatively short period of time that 
photography has uh, developed, you know. Yeah. But if you look at the, at the history of painting, I mean, it, 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 it goes back centuries and centuries ago. You know, it, it goes back a few thousand years ago. You know. Exactly right. It does indeed. It's so interesting you, enough you mentioned uh, that about uh, photography because there's just recently. Uh, um, Ted Forbes did a, a documentary uh, sort of synopsis of uh, Jacques Henri Latigue, and he was showing his work. And basically, uh, Henri Latigue was taking photographs at the age of seven and eight with camera equipment, which I would hasten to add that probably none of us could probably use today to create the work that he was creating. But interestingly enough, when I was in Amsterdam uh, around about six months ago in the foam gallery. Mm -hmm. I came across uh, an Henri Latigue exhibition of color work using autochromes. And I was, I walked in and there was a couple of Americans with me and we were just basically, we say in England, gobsmacked. I just couldn't believe it. Uh, these autochromes that he had created around about 1915, 1925, that sort of time. Yeah. Amazing, amazing work. Subtlety of color. And of course, totally full of grain and full of noise as we would have expected but it, it's full of life full exactly of life. right full of life absolutely superb exhibition which uh uh ted forbes mentioned it in his program i'm giving ted a little plug here for the art of photography but that doesn't matter because he's a great <laughs> presenter yeah. but uh he mentioned this but uh, this thing and i immediately went on to amazon to see if there was a book available and it is uh only latigue in color absolutely amazing book uh I've got, I haven't got it here with me. I've got it in, indoors. I've just started to read through it. Amazing book, which uh, beautiful subtlety of color, which really lends itself to the type of style which you are creating with your architecture work yourself. Let's talk about your inspiration. Now, this is uh, this is a something I hadn't even thought of actually as uh, an inspiration, but far away. Well, the thing is, at this point in time, I've already uh, referred to. Uh, let's say the history of painting yes but at this point in time for my creative and my artistic development i'm most inspired by the works and ideas of mark rothko the famous yeah. american abstract expressionist painter because yeah i've been reading all his books right now i mean this is just one of the, the books that i have uh, on mark rothko and this is another one i have yeah. more ebooks here and the thing is i'm completely obsessed with mark rothko at this point in time and the thing is it's it's not people would ask me okay what's the, the 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 relationship between your black and white work and this colorful abstract work well there it seemingly there isn't any uh, let's say a connection between the, the two of that right no. because I, I create a very uh, concrete uh, uh, black and white architectural photographs while mark rothko is famous for his color field painting but yes. the thing is it's all about it, 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 let's say Mark Rothko's work, and also in my work, at least I'm I, I, I'm attempting to. It's all about the communication of emotions. That's very important because that that is what art is to me: the communication of emotion. And wh what kind of way you're trying to communicate that, uh, either through let's say the medium of painting or through photography, it doesn't matter. But for me, that is the real fine art photography. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. So that's the let's say the similarity between me and Mark Rothko, and but only that, okay? Yeah, there was an exhibition um, I think a couple of years ago at the Tate in London, which put Rothko together with uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto. And, I've, I've, uh, I've heard about that. Yeah, but because if you look at the, if you look at the, let's say uh, Rothko's later work, but the, the let's say the more monochromatic paintings. It's yeah. very much like the uh, the Shujimoto's, uh, uh, uh well seascape work. Exactly right. His seascape work is very simplistic seascape work, and uh, it's two books that I've got on my wish list in Amazon. I'm just waiting for them to come available. There might be Christmas presents lined up, but one is Mark Rothko. I sort of want to get a a book of a uh, book of his work, uh, and uh, Sujimoto's uh, uh, one of uh, Sujimoto's book. You should go to the Tate Gallery in, in London, uh, Paul. I mean, yeah, with, that's with right. With all of Orozco's work, I mean, you're close. Yeah, they to, do. Close to that, so I would, I would go. And yeah, take a trip down there. Don't, don't tell my wife because I've, I've bought too many books already. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell her. <laughs> no, no, don't tell her. Don't tell her. Joel, thank you so much for joining me this evening. This has been absolutely a total treat for me to uh, to hear you talking about your work and. From a, from criminal lawyer to top quality, top notch architect photography, there, there's a story in itself. 
Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Joel. Uh, thank you for joining me. It was an honor being here, Paul. It was very nice being here and talk to you. And hopefully a lot of people have been watching this uh, show. I don't yeah, know. I think we've, we've had a few live viewers as well. I can never tell for sure how many we've got on because the, the counter doesn't give me a true reading, but I'll find out later. So uh, we'll, we'll post it up on YouTube uh, as soon as it's uh, being recorded and uh, we'll, uh, we can post it out on Facebook and Twitter it and uh, tweet it and, uh, and all the other social media that's available. Send me the link then, Paul, okay? Yeah, I will do that. Thank you so much for doing that for me. And suffice to say, everyone, uh, I know it's Thursday. We've got one more day to go, and uh, you know my sign-off. If you're going out shooting this weekend, uh, I'll tell you what, leave your camera bag at home. All the best to you. Bye for now.